Hello everyone, and welcome to Lobster Roll Week 4. I'm your host, Dominic Orp, Shadow Fury, whichever you prefer, and we are going to be starting out today a little bit awkwardly, because as you can see from the bracket, there was... Uh, well, you can't see from the bracket, actually. There were a couple of DQs, but that means that we're going to be starting on the Winner's Quarterfinals, because that is where I ended up looking for a match. So we have, first up, Legomenon and N2O Fighter, currently dealing with map bands, which... You can see here what the actual maps are available. So this week, the rather popular but somewhat overplayed Cobalt Dream and Red Comet were removed from the map pool because they were somewhat overplayed. So instead, we have Mercurial, Baron, Intersection, all really old kind of classic maps. Alongside Frosty Cove, Izzy Channel, Fallen Dell, and Mechad and Sonia, all of which are considerably newer maps. They're all maps that came out, well, with the exception of Frosty Cove. Or, actually, Isky Channel isn't that new either. But they're still less common maps. At any rate, we are going to be playing this game on Baron. And, as you may notice as well, this week we don't have Randy or Golda... Oh, sorry, Randy or Dregs. Randy is busy with work. Dregs is still dealing with health issues, so... Right now, Gorda is definitely the favorite to take this entire tournament. It's going to be a question of... Well, this week's tournament. It's going to be a question of who can actually stand up against them. Because right now, Gorda is not really in a position where they have much to worry about. And that... I don't think... I don't know. I, I, the other players are fighting for second place. Or if they're really going to go, no, I'm going to try to take this. I'm going to try to beat Gorda. I mean, I'm not really sure which attitude is better, but... Well, best of luck to them anyway. So, we are just about ready to get started. We have and Baron Legomenon going for Jump Bots, which is actually exactly what Gota did last time we were on here, last week. Not a not an easy idea to pull off. Jump Bots, of course, being a factory where you can't really rely on having a straightforward assault force to work with, but on a map like Baron, I can kind of see it. But I, only, I say kind of because these these cliffs are all bot passable. Like, you don't have to be playing jump bots or spiders to be able to use these cliffs to their fullest. At least I'm fairly certain you don't. I'll double check once the game starts. So we'll see how Legomenon makes the jump bots tick. On the other hand, n going for cloaky bots bit more of a typical approach to it, and I, I I get it, yeah. So N2O is... Actually, before I start out, let's just double check that this... I was correct about the pathfinding. Yeah, yeah, commanders take bot path, pathing, so... Now, there's not really a whole lot that Legomenon gains from going jump bots other than potentially using jump bot units, which is its own reward, so I'll take that. I'll get that. I mean, there's a lot of cool things you can do with having pyros or placeholders or... The fact that moderators are an infinitely accurate skirmisher with a remarkably long range is, yeah, it's going to be a match. N2 on the other hand going for just a little bit of scouting. Legomon well, scouting with a puppy, which I see is not going to last very long. Fortunately, that didn't really accomplish all that much. Got rid of one of the glaives, sure, but those glaives are there for scouting purposes, not dealing significant damage. And unfortunately, the puppy didn't have a chance to really get into the base, see what's going on. But it doesn't really matter, because the most important thing is the players know what factory the other one picks. The Gomnon going for a few more Pyros. Pyro Puppy. That's their entire setup. And we see N2O immediately switching over to Reavers, which it would be a thing to do. This map is quite small. Not much reason to necessarily invest heavily into Glaives. You don't gain a lot from the speed advantage. And with Reavers... You can do a lot more to get rid of the pyros coming in. So, for now, though, N2O just kind of falling behind a bit. Their expansion... Somewhat stymied by the fact that they're clearly a little concerned about Legomenon killing anything they try to build as they build it. Very focused on base defense. And unfortunately, not able to get rid of that pyro same time, Legomenon not really concerned at all. They have no turrets or anything. They're entirely convinced their pressure will be able to hold back N2O, and so far they're right. N2O has not actually pushed out at all. So, for now, 
Legomenon enjoying a bit of a metal per second advantage, enjoying a massive advantage in terms of their efficiency. They don't have to worry about anything. And one Glaive might come in, get killed, gets killed by a puppy. I mean, okay, the Reaver might come in, but then that leaves the base open. So N2O might not want to do that so quickly. But I'm not sure if N2O has the metal numbers on. They're not going for the more valuable ones first. That is one thing I don't really like about this map. There are so many metal extractors that kind of do nothing. I mean, plus one is not great. That's... Metal extractors cost 70. That's a minute or so to make up for the cost of the metal extractor. Sorry, they cost 90. The minute and a half to make up for the metal extractor. And the minute and a half is a very long time in this game relative to, you know, just building the other stuff. Ooh, and that Reaver unfortunately getting caught in between the commander and a pyro. And it does not have long for this world. Yeah, N2O is unfortunately just going to be falling behind Legomenon. Legomenon has an army that N2O isn't quite sure how to deal with, and which N2O really has ceded ground to. Legomenon continuing to try to find ways to harass this pyro. Eh, not even trying to harass. I thought I was going to go around here and take out this, but no, in fact, it is just going to hang out. Hang out by the commander. No reason not to, really. The commander is a big reason that pyro actually survived the fight with the reaver. And Tuo continuing to push forward, at least. They've got... They've got the Reaver. They have the one Reaver. This hero Reaver might actually be able to turn the game around somewhat. Although it's tricky. Pyros are coming in. Reaver can stop one Pyro, maybe two. But two Pyros, two Puppies. Okay, two Pyros are the only threat. But still. Pyros flying on all sides. This Reaver is on something of a suicide mission. Entoa's commander, on the other hand, is deciding, you know what, screw it, I'm going to fight off the Pyros, and that is a dangerous decision to have made. Pyros do go down. The commander, however, is the real threat there, and that commander, Riot Cannon commander, Entoa's commander, needs to jump away. There is no way it can survive this by walking. There are too many threats around. Entoa, why are you not jumping your commander? Why did you not jump your commander? It has a jump button. It's a recon commander. It's what it does. Ugh. A commander could have lived at this stage in the game. That is massive. That is a huge blow to N2O. Like, they have to basically be able to wipe out their entire opponent's forces with this one Reaver, which the moderator is not allowing. So, no, there really isn't a way for this to get in. This, this Reaver can't do any real damage. Legomenon has twice N2O's economy just because of the commander death. And that commander itself is is going to be fine. N2O is desperately scrabbling for anything at all. Going for a few sites to try to take out the commander, at least try to get revenge, but it may be too little too late. Knight at least trying to come in here along with the Reaver to take back some of the territory on Legomenon's like, side of the wall. Unfortunately, those drones providing far too much constant pressure, and that means... That Reaver can't really do too much. Not even sure what N2O is planning on doing. So far, they haven't really been building much. They've gotten some, a few more extractors, some defense turrets, but they haven't really gotten a hold on the way of actual off offensive forces. One, one Reaver trying to find any expansions over to the northeast, which are non-existent. Legomenon focused entirely on the center trench. And actually focused entirely on taking over N2O's side of the map. Of course, two sides are not going to be enough to get rid of a commander, especially not one with a riot cannon. I'm not entirely sure what the logic is here. I'm not even sure how much N2O can actually build up the proper units to get rid of all the stuff Legomenon has built. That is, Legomenon's... It's just not so much Legomenon's economy is so far ahead. It's that when you're running at 10 metal per second, you're barely even able to produce a factory unit at its standard pace. While well, Legomenon can easily do double time on factory units, while also building metal extractors and defense turrets. Actually, Legomenon right now more limited by energy infrastructure than by metal. Yeah, Legomenon really not in a desperate position at all. I mean, they're reclaiming the recon commander that N2O lost. 
And N2O really doesn't have a whole lot going for them right now. They've got the four sides, which... Again, against this commander is not great. And they realize that, going instead for defenses. Yeah, that didn't quite work out. So that leaves two? Oh, that still leaves four. Where are the others? Oh, the main base, my bad. Fortunately, no positional audio on the side, so I thought they attacked the moderator for some reason. I mean, I like the scouting idea. It's just not going to help when it comes to actually getting rid of anything else. Ah, well, they got rid of something, to be fair. They just didn't get rid of much. I mean, it's main base. Not a whole lot was being built yet, so or anymore. So, yeah, getting rid of one constable is not the biggest deal. Not in that one situation. It is it is a situational thing. Although, ooh, the Gomenon about to smack into a tick. Or imp, rather. But you'd need three or four to be able to stun out the commander, and there's so many support forces. Uh, N2O is just done. There is no way Legomenon is going to lose this. N2O has basically... They they lost the match as soon as they lost their commander. Unfortunately, commander death that early is game-ending, typically. Like, unless you're able to get a revenge shot on your opponent's commander, and Legomenon had already upgraded their commander, which actually would have made a revenge shot even better. But there weren't really the units in place to do that. So really, I'd say N2O's, like, honestly, the biggest mistake I saw N2O make is the fact that they didn't take into account the fact that these metal extractors have very different values. Uh, they got the one, the plus one before the plus 1.8. They didn't immediately go for the 2.1. They, I think they figured that this map, like most maps, has entirely identical mechs values. Baron is one of the few maps that's still played regularly that does not. Its metal extractor values are all over the place, which is actually one of the big reasons why I use the numbers instead of the little metal bars. Despite the metal bars being default. Because it's harder to tell with the metal bars. Although, even with the metal bars, you could tell. But yeah, that's, that's really what it comes down to. N2O just did not take the metal extractors that were more efficient, and... Legomenon was able to outpace them in economy, and then they got the commander kill. And that was that. There wasn't much that N2O could do to catch up. So, unlike last week, I'm not going to be taking that many breaks. I'm probably going to be doing everything up to... Let me I gotta think about this. I kind of want to do winner semis and finals in one run, and most of the losers bracket in one run. I just don't like have a lot of short videos, so we'll see what's up with the with the rest of it. I think there's other games I could go and jump into. Oh yeah, Stuart and Madcraft has maybe not started yet. Yeah, Stuart versus Madcraft has not started yet, so we can go to that. All right, perfect. So next up is Stuart and Ma Stuart versus Madcraft, which will be on Fallendell. A much more interest or a much easier map to understand. I'm pretty sure a much less swingy map. Ugh. So yeah, I think I'll do winners quarterfinals, and once we get to winners semis, I'll take a small break, and then once we get to the huh? once I get to winter semis, then I'll do something. I'll do winter semis and finals, and then probably losers bracket. Maybe two videos for your losers bracket. We'll see, and then do grand finals. Be four videos. It seems more reasonable. I just don't like having, like, a video a day is okay, but I also have, I have pending requests that I've been meaning to do, which I'll probably do on a weekday some, at some point, and I can slot them in between. Or I might do them tomorrow, we'll see. Anyhow, the game is starting, so we should get back to that. Stuart98 going for Tank Factory. Well... 
Mad Crab goes for Cloakie. Tank versus Cloakie on Fallen Dell. Oh, this is going to be really interesting. I really, I'm, I'm excited to see this. So one thing that came out of last week's tournament was this idea that tanks are overpowered, or at least overtuned, or Kodachis at the very, very least are overtuned. And Cobalt Dream and Red Comet may have been the reason for that. Now, granted, Fallen Dell is still a fairly flat map, but there are slopes. There are places that are red, which means that the Kadachi is going to slow down going up them. So I'm curious to see if tanks on this map are as viable because tanks are tanks and have Kodachi, which are very strong, or if tanks are not as viable because in reality they were just that strong because Cobalt Dream and Red Comet allow you to just push forward with units, never really thinking about it too much, or not requiring as much micro as other factories do. And on a map like Red Comet or Cobalt Dream, you just out macro your opponent and win. Whereas an app like this with more terrain, well, let's all find out. First engagement comes in here. Excuse me. Oops. Anyway, first engagement comes in here, and we have Kodachi getting a bit of damage in, but not anything meaningful. Not getting rid of any of the metal extractors. Not really doing much damage to any of the workers, anything like that. So, so far, so good. Same time, Glaive coming around the back, not able to do much either. Unfortunately, into tanks, Cloakie has a tough time because of the fact that welders do have defense turrets. On the other hand, the Kodachi can't really easily go up the hill. The, the Lotus will stop them as they try to come up. So far, Madcraft will be able to expand and build up their infrastructure fairly safely. Stuart 98, on the other hand, is... Also in a reasonable position that way. The one difference, though, as I point out a lot of the time, Cloakbots are cheaper. Way cheaper. Like, a Kodachi is worth three Glaives. That's the scale we're talking about here, unfortunately. Ooh, that Kodachi did a great job getting rid of the Conjurer. But yeah, three Glaives is a Kodachi in terms of price. Not necessarily in terms of effectiveness, because Kodachis do have splash damage that's pretty decent for getting rid of Raiders, but definitely in terms of price. So, really, Madcraft can afford to have Glaives going out in groups of three like this. It's the same as Stuart 98 having their Kodachis go out one at a time. However, uh, Madcraft switching over to Ronin. I, I like the idea in general. I, mean, I can kind of see where they're coming from in terms of getting rid of the Kodachi, although I'm not sure if it really works with the Kodachi's speed. Also, they really need to micro the Glaze more. Like, I, I don't want to critique too much, but unfortunately, Madcraft is losing a lot more Glaze than they would need to because they're getting hit by the splash damage of Kodachi's fire. It's one of the situations where you have to be very mindful of the positioning. I mean, I think Madcraft is using line move. Yeah, they're using line move. That's fine. It's just a matter of knowing exactly where to position your Glaze relative to your target, especially as it's moving. Honestly, Glaive Micro is tricky. Micro in this game is tricky. It's it's kind of one of those things where the game is designed around reducing the need for Micro, but where it exists, it is really tricky. And Okay, Madcraft was not paying attention to that, because they're paying attention to the main base, because the main base is getting under heavy fire, and there's not much that the Ronin can do about it. Gotta say, this is one of those situations where I think the campaign is really good because what the campaign tells you to do in this situation is get imps have the vehicles whatever run over the imps get stunned and then come at them with other forces it's a surprisingly effective way of getting rid of them i've seen it used in multiplayer matches to great effect but unfortunately it's kind of too late Stuart 98's just yeah they got the factory down madcraft has got nothing they have nothing on the field they have nothing in in their production. They had... They were pretty okay with the Glaives, with, you know, groups of three running around the map. But the problem is those never really were played right to get rid of a Kodachi. It's something that doesn't get brought up much, but Cloakpot Factory is a high micro factory. You... Not so much in the early game most of the time, but then again, Raider Micro is huge in 0k. 
So you got to be careful about that. You got to know that you're going to be, especially with heavy glaives, doing a lot of micromanagement. And you got to be very mindful of all of your forces. Especially when you have groups split up like that. You have to have a very quick trigger finger to go in and start actually micromanaging them. Whereas the tank player just has the one Kodachi, and it's, I mean, it's just one of it, so it doesn't have to worry about positioning for splash damage or anything. Madcraft looking to rebuild a Cloakbot factory, and they do have 20 metal per second, so they're not hopeless. And they have a reasonably well-defended position in the hills, which actually is really strong considering the tanks have a hard time getting up there. Although I'm honestly surprised Stuart 98 is continuing to go for Kodachis. I am genuinely surprised that's what Stuart 98 is massing up. This is a huge exploitable point for Madcraft. I mean, it would make sense to make some Reavers. It would definitely make a lot of sense to make some Imps throw them, on, throw them around the map. Because Kodachi's... I mean, the Reavers alone would do a lot of damage. I don't really see Ronin doing a lot of damage. And the Glaives will be completely wrecked. These Glaives will do nothing. There's no way they can get in there and do enough damage with all the splash damage coming in. I just... I'm sorry. That's not how it's going to work. Reavers would have something of a chance. Though you still need several of them. But then again, this is a thousand plus metal worth of Kodachis. So that's fine. Man, I don't, I don't think Madcraft quite realizes just how big these are. Oh! Oh, wait! No, I know what's going on. This is Madcraft. They're a Cloakybot specialist. I remember before seeing they were playing on... Last week, they were playing on Bandit Planes all the time. They went Cloakbot, three pads, and then Shieldbot transitioned later in the game. That's what's going on. Although, to be fair, their commander actually showing off why a strong right unit would have been the right choice here. Which is... That light particle beam, that is the red back weapon, by the way, completely wrecked all the Kodachis. All of them. Every single Kodachi that went into that base died to that light particle beam. So get some riot units, set it up either a slow push or just on the defensive, and then use that. Ronin rockets will be dodged by Kodachis generally. Glaze will be torn apart by the splash damage, but honestly, Reaver, maybe Reaver Knight, that would go a long way. But Glaive Ronin, I do not see having much of an effect here. And, of course, we have Ogres coming in as well, just as a last insult. But yeah, this is not... I don't I don't agree with Super Knight here, by the way, in the chat. I, I can't say anything because spec mute, but... I... But, yeah, this, I think... I don't agree with, with Stuart here, mainly because Imps haven't been used once. And, like, a single imp is cheaper than a Kodachi. So if an imp is able to stop two Kodachis, hell, even one Kodachi, it's made cost. Like, Madcraft, I don't think, quite realizes that. It's, uh, I don't know, this is honestly one of the hardest things to really understand playing this game, especially in the moment, is just how important costs are. I mean, granted, Stuart 98 has a massive economic advantage, but still. Imps nullify the speed advantage of Kodachis, and then you can just come in with anything you want. Like a bunch of glaives or whatever. Or warrior, or reavers rather. Go to in chat pointing out, make some reavers, then some knights. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Reaver knight. Reaver knight. The reavers get rid of the Kodachis. The knights basically stun anything else that tries to come in, especially if they start getting into welders. And also stun the Kodachis if they get too close. It's a slower build. You have to expand more slowly, and that's tougher to maintain. But... Ultimately, you don't lose gla you don't lose several Kodachis worth of glaives just trying to get your early raiding going. I mean, maybe have maybe have some gla glaive parties going around the map. Like just like there's a lot of undefended expansions around here that a few good glaives would be able to wipe out no problem. And earlier on, there also were, but at this, at, especially at this stage of the game. But also, you know, if Madcraft hadn't completely been thrown off and fallen behind then, yeah, Reaver Knight could have easily done it. Now, unfortunately, it's a little late for Reavers, what with the Minotaurs coming in here and doing so much damage. But even then, they're not going to be worthless. They're just not going to be as useful as they would have been five minutes ago. But, I mean, I get it. I get the logic, because you're thinking, oh, I want to make sure I don't lose the Raider game. But it's like, yeah, but 
Especially if you already lost half a dozen glaives to a handful of Kodachis. Like, no. Like, three glaives against one Kodachi, well microed, the glaives will win. But that's how glaives are. Well microed, they'll win. Poorly microed to allow splash damage to actually affect them, they lose, as we saw. Reavers, on the other hand, just don't care, and knights have so too much health to care. Like, Madcraft is actually doing remarkably well on Attrition at, at this point, just because they have Reavers now. And they had Stardust, which are just Reavers on a stick. They would have been able to get rid of a lot of these forces earlier on, but at this point, Stuart has such a huge metal ad advantage that short of Madcraft being able to split up their attention enough to get Glaives around the map to start harassing, assuming they even knew that they lost their command, and it's even harder to do. I think at this point, they've lost all morale. But yeah, I don't think this was a great representation of the matchup. I'm sorry, Madcraft, but it just it, there's a lot of units that weren't used that would have been very handy here. And I just, I don't know. I hope, hopefully we see some stuff later on with, like, tank on maps that aren't Cobalt Dreamer Red Comet and see how that works out. Because I don't think, I don't think that was because of tank. I think that was because the Cloakbot player did not use the units that would have gotten rid of the tanks. Like, Imps were forgotten, Reavers were forgotten, and those units are really strong against dealing with vehicles. Reavers in particular for the defensive side, and Imps, Imps more as a way of just stopping them as a force multiplier for your Glaives. That's a huge part of it. But yeah, it's also worth noting, you know, the Cloakbot factory, Cloakbot units have to, it can't easily take a direct engagement. Although they, I mean, again, played right, they kind of can, but, you know, you have to be a bit sneaky. Because they're cloakbots. Cloakbots are sneaky. That's how they work. If you want to go super direct, you go for shield bots. That's, that's the direct option. Anyhow, I think that's going to be it for this round. I think we're moving on to the... Are we moving on to the quarterfinals? I'm not sure. Oh, no, we won't be, because the winner's quarterfinals must continue, since the round of 16 had a couple matches which have not been completely completed yet. So, we'll deal with that next. Alright, who is next? Okay, we still blue and Ted McFred. Where is still blue and Ted McFred? Okay, I'm confused. The brackets are apparently wrong. Nah. Okay. Okay, I get that, Stuart, that Kodachi's put you at a bit of an early game disadvantage, but again, Kodachi's cost the same as three glaives, and properly microed, three glaives look like they could easily beat a Kodachi. And if it's not three glaives, then put an extra glaive on there. Fine. Whatever. But if you can reliably get rid of the Kodachis, then you're in a really good spot. Not to mention on a map like that where Kodachis have a lot of sections where they're slowed down. Sure, it's a bit trickier. But I still think you have... I still think tanks aren't as strong as they looked in that match. I think that match was really set up. I think that match just, unfortunately, the Kloki player did not play it right.
All right, there we go. Just got the show on the road. So yeah, we are getting well, getting into the map band stage. Figure out what people want, what people don't want. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the way it's working this week is that the maps are getting banned down like, back and forth. Last week it was just one player banned four, and the other player picked, which is kind of Smash Bros. ish. Well, actually, it's Rivals of Aether is, in fact, the only game I can think of offhand that uses that, which is Smash Bros. ish. Whereas today it's using the actual Smash Bros. rule set for this, which is, I say that just because the tournament organizer, Crow or Psycho or whatever, has experience with Smash Ultimate tournaments, and they took some of the rules from that. Anyhow, this week it's everyone bans back and forth until you get down to one map. Or three maps in the case of a best of three. So everyone's playing maps that they don't dislike. Which so far has been, at least on stream, Baron and Fallendell. So Frosty has been banned out and Anyway, we're just gonna deal with all this stuff, so Yeah, sorry Kingstad pointing on chat there's not a lot of room for doing matchmaking matches. I I have requests that I'm planning on doing probably maybe tomorrow, honestly, and then just have the videos interleave between the tournament and the request casts just to have something like just to get through them because the longer i wait the more outdated they become and it just becomes harder to i mean the requests that people gave me like months ago i don't want to drop them but i also can't wait too long to do them like otherwise the game the balance changes and there's and that can cause issues as far as how useful the cast is. Also, I think after a while, replays get deleted or at least archived away. So if I don't do it quickly enough, I might not actually have access to the replay to work with. <laughs> Alright, well, so far... Oh, shoot, I'm as silly. I could have done... I should also cut in stuff to tell, tell people what maps were being banned out as people went, which would have been a good idea. But now, anyway, Frosty, Mercurial, Fallendell are out. Which leaves Iski, Fallen, or Iski, Baron, Intersection, and Mechansania. Mechansania is out, so that's Iski, Baron, and Intersection. So, it seems like both players are really wanting those smaller, simpler maps like Baron Intersection. I expect Izki... No, Baron's out first. Now it's just Izki or Intersection. We might actually have a C game today. Or right now. In just a minute. We'll find out! Let's see. Where's the next thing there I got? Izki's out. No, we have Intersection. That is our map for today is Intersection! A map I have not seen in a very long time. can't say I terribly missed it, but yeah. That is, that is the thing that is happening right now. So, intersection it is, and also other side of the bracket. I think Danielson, did they get DQ'd? That's weird. Anyway, Goda will be up against Bloa on the other side of the bracket. Not sure if we'll have time to get to that, because I think they're starting simultaneously, and I don't know how long the match will take relative to this one. If we can, I will jump over to it just to be complete, but I don't know if we can. So far, we've gotten kind of lucky in no way, because every match that's been played has been played essentially in a row. Haven't needed to jump into the middle of a running match. I expect as we go further in the tournament, that won't be the case. Because, you know, we, the timing will go a little out of sync. But it just so happened. Just so happened that we were able to catch all the matches so far today, right as they started.
Anyhow, we have... Well, intersection. As it always is, Ted McRed going for tanks. Steel blue. Going for cloakies. So we get another cloaky tank matchup on a more rampy map. Not exactly a hilly map, but sort of that same idea. So yeah, with that, we'll see how this goes. And I will yell at Reshade because the stupid thing is not doing what it should. Anyway, I've got to make that ambient inclusion thing a widget at some point. I just don't have the timer mana. Anyway, with Steel Blue going kind of economical at first. On the other hand, Ted McFred going for an early Kodachi, which is, of course, what you'd do as tanks. Anyway, Steel Blue with just about three glaives. Again, my contention is that three glaives, they cost the same as a Kodachi. They should, in theory, be able to fight a Kodachi relatively evenly. Now, we're not going to see that right now. The Kodachi is instead going to run into the commander, if anything. And the commander is well aware of this. And they have radar. That is, that is what radar do. So, Steel Blue knowing this. I'm curious to see if they're going to go in for three glaives at a time all the time, or if they're just going to do this one time because actually three glaives is generally not a great number. <laughs> when it comes to early scouting, you either want one or like five. One if you just want to get in and look at stuff, and five if you want to deal some significant damage. Three is often just enough to get them killed without actually doing much. But then again, against heavy tanks where they are running... You know, 180 unit, or any metal raider all over the place. It's not as big of a waste, relatively. Also, Reavers! This is why I said Reavers! Because Reavers kill Kodachis! This dead Kodachi corpse, it's because of the Reaver! Take notes, everyone. That is how this works. Same time, we are going to get a three glaive versus Kodachi fight, potentially. Though I kind of like the fact that Steel Blue is not going for it and pretending. I mean, that's, that is a fight I think they could maybe take, but they'd still lose at least a Glaive. Possibly two. It's also worth noting, this map is kind of small. Reavers don't take that long to get along across this map, which is another thing that gave tanks a huge advantage on Cobalt Dream in particular, and to a lesser extent, Red Comet. The map is... The, those maps are huge. This map is not. So, the speed disadvantage for Reavers isn't really that significant compared to how much metal can be grabbed and all that, and that how much can be defended easily. That, that is really what it comes down to, is how quickly players can safely expand. And Ted McFred isn't really expanding that quickly either, although I, maybe we can also view it as the opposite of the last game, where now it's the person playing tanks who is maybe not quite as proficient. I don't know. It would have to be like a gold versus Randy match or something that goes to Cloaky versus Tanks in order for it to really be clear just how that plays out. But for now, though, Reaver's doing a fine job defending. Ted McFred cannot get in with Kodachis. They might be able to get in with Blitzes. Ogres would also do well. But I don't know what they're going for right now. Apparently, according to Kingstad and Chat, Ted McFred is, in fact, a tank specialist. So, that would imply that they'd have a reasonable knowledge of what to do with the factory when you don't have Kodachis being your go-to unit. Especially as Steel Blue has gone, in fact, for the Reaver Knight composition that I was talking about last game. Which I'm very glad to see, because it means that the Reaver Knight is at least being experimented with. Although, I, I I don't know. Like I said, the size of the map does mean Reaver Knight is a bit more powerful than it would otherwise be. I think if Reaver Knight was played in Fallendale, it'd be a bit of a fairer, fairer test. But, I mean, hey, we will probably see Cloakbot. I mean, so far, Steel Blue has a massive advantage, so we might actually just see Cloakbot win out against tanks at least once. Ooh, yeah, King's Dead pointing out in chat that the Steel Blue could have had a chance to send their Glaze up here and take out all the wind generators. Which is a 
pretty big deal. Like, that is worth noting. Oh, did I could have just go down to th three glaives? Got rid of a Kodachi. At the cost of one glaive, mind you, but still, got rid of a Kodachi. Now, the rest of it is just assault against Raider. Against single Raider. Ooh, but then again, you have Blitz coming in here as well. That's going to make it tricky. Blitz kind of winning out that fight. But more knights coming in, and more importantly, Ted McFred unable to really expand. Hard to see how they're going to be able to get out of this easily. There's Reavers. Ooh, did they get, yeah, they got rid of a Blitz. Two Reavers gets rid of a Blitz. And cheaper than that, too. Actually, that two Reavers with the Lotus support. Although, unfortunately, the Blitz does stun out the Reaver pretty effectively on its own. But even then, the Reaver would have won. Wow, okay. Yeah, again, the problem is that Blitzes are way faster. They don't have to engage the Reavers. That's the thing to bear in mind. That's the tricky thing about tanks is that, you know, their move, their units are faster. On a map like this, it doesn't matter. Like, the important strategic locations are being assaulted directly, and there's not much that a tank player can do just to avoid an engagement. They just lose their stuff. So avoiding an engagement is not really the way to go here. In fact, apart from the fact that the knights are, I guess, hitting a radar dot. Yeah, they're hitting a radar dot. That's why I was screwing up. They were otherwise doing fine. So with that, Steel Blue really has the force composition to get rid of what Ted McFred is building. And Ted McFred, I'm not sure what they have in mind other than more Blitzes and Kodachis, which I'm not confident in. Not gonna lie, I have very little confidence in the ability for those units to actually do much against Reaver Knight. I could see a Minotaur doing well against the, Reaver, the Knight and maybe maybe get Ogres for the, for the Reavers. There isn't really a Skirmisher. That's the thing. There isn't really a Skirmisher here. There's... There just isn't. Ogres are kind of skirmy, but it's more that they have a lot more HP than Reavers and would be able to hit them for enough damage to probably be able to significantly dis like, disrupt their ability to actually hold ground. But now we're just getting a lot of Kodachis and Blitzes. 2,000 metal worth! Against, like, a thousand-ish metal worth of what will effectively be their counter unit. Although, those units are out of position. So far, it's just one small force. Knight doing a reasonably decent job, but unfortunately getting overwhelmed. Well, first knight does go down. Second knight and the reaver. Actually, the reaver also down. Second knight is under heavy fire. Bliss is coming for the commander. Do have the commander locked down. The knight's coming in to save the day, though. The commander is still doomed. Fortunately, that yeah, commander is out. That is that is a blow. That was quite the push. Unfortunately, the biggest loss of that is the fact that the commander being down means all this reclaim can't easily be grabbed for Steel Blue. The fact that that is the biggest loss should tell you just how bad of a position Ted McFred is in right now. They lost their entire army. There are still knights coming in. Steel Blue still has an economic advantage. I mean, there are reavers coming through here. Or, sorry, reavers. Welders coming through here to try to take out everything that's been built up, but they don't quite have the firepower to get rid of all the lotuses. I mean... Pretty clever, Steel Blue. There's an eye of Lotuses. I mean, it's what your constructor can do. Well, then, hide. So yeah, good play there. Yeah, unfortunately, Ted McFred, that was, that was kind of their only real hope. And they got rid of the commander, but Steel Blue is so far ahead that losing the commander wasn't even that big of a deal. Knight's able to get rid of the defenses afterwards. There's no army in back. And Ted McFred now staring down the barrel of going to the loser's bracket. Well, I mean, you know, it's double elimination. They still have a chance to get in. But yeah, unfortunately, Ted McFred was really pushed back to the point that they weren't able to expand, which is kind of surprising. Again, tanks are the more mobile factory. They have faster units, or at least in theory they do. 52, 57, I guess the... Now, the Weller's not much faster than the Conjurer. But the Kodachis are very speedy. I mean, you have that, 97, compared to 51 here. Like, Blitzes and Kodachis run circles around Knights and Reavers. But again, the size of the map just means that there isn't really mar much room to run. And also by this point, Steel Blue had 
like, like I said, they pushed Ted McBride against the wall. They couldn't really disengage or raid around or whatever in order to try to distract Steel Blue. It was, they had to defend their base. It was that or death. So, I mean, Cloakbot can win against tanks, sort of. But again, in this case, the tank player could have gone Ogres. Maybe could have gone Minotaur. Could have expanded a bit more aggressively in the early game. And Intersection is not a good tank map. I don't know why Ted McFred won tanks here, although it was interesting to see. Because, again, trying to go up these ramps, it's really slow. And there's a lot that's really slow on. Again, tanks lose speed going uphill. And... Oh, never mind. That's not that uphill. It's a little uphill. You can see it's slight red. It's a slight slowdown compared to bots, where it's pure green. But still, it doesn't help. So with that, it looks like Steel Blue will, move, will be moving on to fight Legomenon. Ted McFray will be going to the lower bracket to fight whoever wins between Madcraft and Russia Dewey Fruity. So, a rematch between Fruity and Ted McFred could happen. Very well could be a thing. Sorry, my bad. Not That won't happen. That won't happen until losers' semifinals. Sorry, it, they'd be the winner of N2O and Danielson. But either way, that was that. And I, unless Golda and Blow are still going on with their match, I think that'll be it for the winners' quarterfinals. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that is. They actually already started the semifinals. Okay, well, I'm not going to take a break. I'm just going to switch. I'm going to do the intro thing so I can easily split the video. So, hang on a sec.